This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and it's that time of year, folks. It's iPhone time. iPhone 7, ooh, black, matte black, and the iPhone 7 Plus. The changes are largely on the inside this time around, though. With the introduction of black, you get the invisible antenna lines, which is kind of nice. And there's that shiny jet black option as well. But neat things. And a lot of it's catching up with the Android competitors, to be honest. You have things like IP67 water resistance. So... Good golly, if it falls in the toilet, ew, ew, we don't want to think about that. You might be okay if you spill your drink on it. You might be okay if it's something sticky like a milkshake. You got to rinse it off, but you can rinse it off. Nice right there. We also have faster processes inside and the usual leapfrogging, you know, where whoever comes out most recently has the faster CPU. It's happened again. So right now, Apple really is trouncing the Snapdragon 820 in terms of benchmark performance. We've got more colorful displays on board, still no AMOLED, oh yeah, and a lot of other things. We're going to look at them now. So I'm not going to go every over every single thing that's the same as the previous generation iPhones. Goodness, it looks enough alike. Life is too short to talk about those things. Every year it's a new CPU, and this time Apple made a big jump forward. We finally have a quad-core CPU. Not that their dual-core CPUs were lacking. Cores are not everything. In fact, you know, Qualcomm has gone back to quad-cores. They tried octa-cores for a while in the, the world of Android. But we have a 2.33 gigahertz Apple A10 Fusion CPU, as they call it, 64-bit quad-core, with an embedded M10 motion coprocessor. That M10 coprocessor, or the M9 in the iPhone, iPhone 6S generation and also iPhone SE are necessary for the new lift to wake function. That means you pick up the phone and the screen briefly turns on so you can see stuff. You don't actually have to hit the power button or deal with the fact that that fingerprint scanner is too fast for anybody's business to actually just take a look at your sleeping screen. I do like that feature a lot. 2 gigs of DDR4 RAM in your iPhone 7, 3 gigs in the iPhone 7 Plus. So you get something more than dual cameras and a bigger screen there in the Plus model. Apple has increased storage capacities, so the pricing starts at $650 for the regular iPhone 7, and that's with 32 gigs of storage. The next jump up in each of these will cost you $100 more, is 128 gigs, and then finally there's a 256 gig model. Now you got the same storage options with the iPhone 7 Plus, but the base price is $769, not $750. So again, $100 more for each storage increment up that you go. The big brouhaha, there is no headphone jack anymore, bye-bye no more. Instead, you have the lightning port and you get a pair of Apple earbuds with a lightning connector instead and an itsy-bitsy little dongle that will adapt to 3.5 millimeter for your standard wired headphones. So you don't have to throw your headphones away. Charging at the same time as using headphones, this is going to require splitter, I guess. Uh, that's getting a little bit messy there, isn't it? And of course, they're the wireless solution, the Apple AirPods. Okay, just kidding. You've seen the joke, the dental health moment here. But they do look an awful lot like this, and they come with a little charging pack that looks like that. $160 Bluetooth headphones from Apple coming next month, or any other Bluetooth headphones you want to use. And then there's also just the usual earbuds that come in the box. Gone is the cute little plastic box that used to came in, but come in. But now we have a lightning connector on the end. And here's your little teeny dongle adapter. So if you have some nice high-end headphones like these, uh, you can still use them. And I suggest you just leave the dongle connected to your headphones because that way you probably won't lose it so easily. If you lose that teeny weeny little dongle, and boy, you probably will if you're like me, that's going to cost you $9 to buy another one. Battery capacity is up in both models, and Apple claims an actual hour of use time, not just standby time, increased thanks to that. So good times there, and Apple's generally pretty accurate with their battery claims for their laptops and their phones, and so far we're seeing it spot on. And I did have an iPhone 6S Plus for quite a long time, and I, I can say that the new 7 Plus is outlasting it by a bit, but it already had fantastic battery life, that big one. 2,900 milliamps in the 7 Plus, 1,960 milliamps for the little iPhone 7. The display resolution is the same, and the size is the same as the previous generations, but you get a higher color gamut, P3 color gamut standard. So the displays are more vivid, more luscious looking, and they're anti-reflective, relatively speaking, for glossy displays. So yeah, they are nice looking, and of course, it lets you see the higher color gamut in those new cameras too, but it's still not super AMOLED. I do kind of miss the note 
Note 7 and the Galaxy S7 screens for that super vibrant and fairly accurate look. One thing to note, and speaking of color accuracy, Apple usually tries to ship these with pretty well calibrated displays, so the whites may look a little yellow to you. A lot of laptops, in fact, almost all of them, and many phones ship with displays that are actually too cold. That is blue-white. So warm white it could be the more accurate one and you're just not used to it. But that said, if it really, really bugs you, you can go into settings, accessibility settings, which is under general, and you can actually play with the color temperature of the screen. And I did notice that the 7 is the warmer one compared to the 7 Plus. Go figure, who knows. Obviously there's new color, or colors, or the absence of color, as technically black is, you have the standard black one, which is matte black, which I think is so nice looking. It does show fingerprints though, but stealthy, particularly helps with the big 7 Plus, which is, well, one heck of a plank of a foam. And then there's the ooh, jet black, which is shiny, highly polished, more prone to scratches, Apple warns us, and goodness, it loves fingerprints too. I personally will admire that one from afar, but I wouldn't buy it because I'm a little too worried about those scratches and your fingerprints and all that kind of thing. Another big change, the home button. Our mechanical clicky friend of old is gone. It's now a solid state button with haptic feedback, vibration feedback, that haptic engine. Uh, you know, kind of like the M recent MacBook Pro trackpad thing. It takes a little getting used to. I found it easy to use that sort of button, minus the haptic engine, of course, on the HTC 10. But here, it's probably just muscle memory. I'm so used to iPhones with physical clicky buttons, it was weird. Uh, using it on a desk, it kind of feels like a button is clicking, but when you hold it in your hand, you can feel that the whole phone is really vibrating. In terms of clicking, you still have the double click for multitasking, and if you enable this in accessibility, it's really cool. Triple clicking the button quickly brings, opens the camera and, and creates the magnifying mode. So if you're looking at something really tiny, as like I often do, I have to read the tiny print on chargers to see what they're rated at for phones, that sort of thing. It's a handy way to have a lighted, well, magnifying glass. One nice thing about the design of the phone uh, is that they have done a better job of making those antenna lines a little bit more organically integrated. They move them towards the edges of the phone so they're not stripes on the back of the camera. Of course, if you opt for either the black or the jet black phones, then the lines are black too, so they really blend in. So if you hated the antenna lines, that's a nice little improvement going on there visually. By the way, the camera has actually moved a little bit on even on the iPhone 7, which doesn't have the dual cameras. If you try on an old iPhone 6 or 6S case, you'll notice that it's actually in a slightly different position. And your friend the X-Acto knife probably won't be good enough to help you out. So you probably are going to need a new case, even though the phone is the same size, the same thickness, the buttons are in the same place. So how about audio quality? With this change to the lightning headphone jack, this all digital thing going on, of course, it ends up ultimately being analog when it goes to the set of headphones that you're wearing. Those have to be analog. Audio quality did get better. Now I compared it to the HTC 10, which is supposed to have a high quality amplifier and circuitry. And well, it does have a good DAC in it. And only the LG V20, which is just absurdly, amazingly good audio. 32-bit DAC in that LG V20. That's the best thing about perhaps the V20. Other than that, the iPhone really held its own and did better than most of the competitors. I'd say it even edged out the HTC 10. They've, Apple always uses their own custom design. They get together with Cirrus Logic and make their own audio codec and own audio amplifiers. So there's nothing really to compare it to. You can't say, well, it's an ESS Sabre and everybody knows what one of those is if you're into audio. So going on specs isn't really going to help here. But experientially, you tried it with a bunch of high-end earbuds and over-the-ear headphones and nice, loud, full, a little biased toward the bass though. Maybe it's that whole beats influence there. But the bass can be, if you're looking for detail in the bass, a little bit undifferentiated and muddy, and that's being very picky. That's compared to the LG V20 or home stereo system there. So overall, yes, it's improved, and maybe that iPod heritage is coming back a little bit here for the audio quality. Oh, hey, and for the first time ever, stereo speakers in an iPhone. You still have the speaker on the bottom, and the earpiece becomes your second speaker. So one fires out the side, one fires out the front. It's noticeably louder, and it sounds fuller, too. So the big news, of course, is the iPhone 7 Plus's dual camera system. It has a traditional kind of wide-angle camera lens, and it's got a 
telephoto, which are a really short norm, normal lens, what we would call a 56 kind of millimeter. Those of you who are into photography know what that means. That's a pretty versatile, everyday, doesn't distort things too much focal length, that 56 millimeter, close to the 50 millimeter carry around, walk around lens. That is pretty exciting stuff if you are into photography. If you're like me, if you do use a, a digital SLR and you carry around a bunch of lenses, you know, it's like being able to swap the, the lenses on and off your camera, lightning fast and have your wide angle and have your slightly telephoto lens. It's great. It's versatile. And here's why Apple Apple's smart. You know, they're not the first to use two cameras. HTC has done it. We've seen it, of course, on the LG G5 and the V20. And, you know, with, with LG, they gave you an ultra, ultra wide angle lens, probably equivalent to something like 14 millimeter. It's so wide, it distorts everything, unless you're visiting the Grand Canyon it, or you're doing realtor kind of shots indoors. It's hard to find a use for it, but everybody wants to zoom in on their pictures, but you don't want to use digital zoom because then, well, it looks kind of craptastic, doesn't it? So this is something that a lot of people want. It's also more flattering when taking people pictures. People don't look good when you take them with the usual wide angle lens. You have to really step back, then maybe have more background than you want to. Suddenly you can do portraits. You can get detail where you didn't have it before. And it's as easy as tapping the button on screen to switch. You can do the regular digital zoom by dragging your finger up and down on there, but just tapping the 1x, 2x button is how you're gonna switch between those two separate lenses, both of which are 12 megapixel. The standard wide angle lens is f1.8 aperture, so it's gotten wider for better low light photography, and it does seem to help. And it's f2.8 for the telephoto. Why the difference? I don't know. With the plus model, you get 10x zoom total. Of course, that's digital zoom. With the standard iPhone 7, you get 5x zoom. Now, the regular iPhone 7 is no such. It still has, well, that newer, wider aperture lens, a new image processing engine, and it, it is a little bit better than the previous iPhone. Now, coming up, we've got a, several sample photos so you can see what the camera can actually do. And we've even thrown in a Samsung picture so you get the idea. All right, here we have the standard iPhone 7 camera, what we could, would call the wide view camera now, I suppose. It's the standard view. And you can see the detail in the trees, the, the bushes. That looks normal. I see a little bit of painting on of the slate, a little bit of white out over here. It's still a camera phone, folks. It's by far not perfect if you're used to, say, a digital SLR camera. And let's take a zoom in so you can see right there. Not bad. Next up, we have the telephoto camera, let's call it that, at 56 millimeter field of view. So here you go. If I had digitally zoomed in like I did in the previous picture, you saw a lot of detail going away. This way you keep all the detail. I think this is what most people want because you, you have this urge to zoom, but every time you use digital zoom, you say, oh, well, that doesn't look so great anymore. Next, indoor low light. The cat looks a little bit uh, watercolory here. It looks like Apple's going back to that algorithm, but still it's a nice shot of the cat and the gnome together. And this was shot without a flash. Indoor is in a pretty dark environment, even though it looks pretty bright overall. Next, the cat in low light. This was shot indoors twilight, filtered light through just one window, no flash. Without the flash, color looks pretty normal there. The camera actually chose to not use the flash. And again, this is shot with a new telephoto lens. So you got a little bit of a depth of field effect right here. See the cat's face is the sharpest thing. And he is a little less sharp over here as he fades away. It's not a lot of bokeh or blurring of the background and we, we're going to have to wait until next month, October 2016, to see the faux bokeh or foca algorithm that Apple's working on to use the dual cameras together to try to do the background defocus effect that HTC has done previously with cameras too. Probably knowing Apple, they'll make it easier to use and people will actually get into it more than has been the case with other phone cameras that offer this feature. And as a comparison, here's the same kitty cat, obviously shot with the Samsung Galaxy S7 camera, same camera that's in the S7 Edge and the Note 7. And it's a pretty nice one too. Notice that it's kind of that typical indoor yellowed out look. Also, this was shot in low light, but nice detail again on his face and the same a bit of depth of field on the back. These cameras are going to be neck and neck, other than the, the, the feature that you've got with the two cameras and the two focal lengths on the iPhone 7 Plus. Here, a pretty outdoor shot. It looks like a camera phone still because you, you see a little bit of white out on the flowers over here. I know I'm picky, but hey, folks, if you know me, you know that I'm a real serious photographer. And you can check out my Flickr page and my Instagram page to see the kind of 
shots that I usually take. And I typically use Sony mirrorless cameras, kind of high end ones, and also Canon full frame cameras. So I'm being picky here for the average person. This is pretty nice stuff. A lot of detail, not exactly what I would call over sharpen either. Let's zoom in and take a look here. The leaves still look pretty natural. For example, that's, that's nice. This is a toughie right here because it's very harsh lighting, part shade, part direct sunlight. And our friend, the gnome here, isn't whited out at all. The detail in the beard is still here. It's really very impressively done here. And this was taken with the iPhone 7. Right down to seeing the patina of dust on his cap. Sorry, gnome, I should give you a bath. And here's a shot into the sun because, well, that's a pretty thing a bit after sunrise. And we've got the haze. You can still see there the atmosphere, which looks pretty nice. Uh, I might dehaze this picture a little. I might actually choose to leave it that way to give you the idea. It's still the morning. There's almost like a fog going on. It's a nice enough picture, and it handled the, the sun pretty well in the sky. And we've got, see right over here? Wee! Haha. <laughs> We've got, this happens with cameras, uh, even if you have that nice sapphire crystal glass on the top, camera lenses will refra refract light if you shoot directly into the sun. And that's just, well, par for the course. And lastly, this is a yucca. Lots of detail here. This is taken with the telephoto lens. I just couldn't have gotten this with this traditional, more wide angle phone lens. Nice. Look at this over here. All that nice detail. Doesn't look unnatural either. So there you have it, the iPhone 7, the iPhone 7 Plus. As ever, of course, they're Apple's best phones. They're not going to make a worse phone. Although some of you might say that the missing headphone jack makes it a worse phone. I leave that up to you to decide. As long as there's a dongle adapter, I'm okay. And I know a lot of people are using wireless headphones these days. Yes, the design hasn't changed much. Maybe someday they will, but there's nothing wrong with the design. It's very pretty. It's just, well, folks do like change. That's probably the biggest issue with it. But in terms of performance, CPU, once again, they've leapfrogged ahead of Android. The cameras, particularly this dual camera setup, is a dream. Very nice dual camera setup over here that's actually useful, not just a gimmick. Water resistance, very important. I like the motion detection where you can raise to wake. The fingerprint button scanner is just so insanely fast. It's just crazy. And I'm even okay with the new solid state button because you know what? I used to wear the buttons out on old generation iPhones. So there you have it. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos.